Let's start today in Luke. So if you want to turn to chapter 6, I'll meet you there in a moment. Um, I want to just begin with, a, with an address and make sure we're going here. Um, just address the idea of, of uh, error. Because my whole life in the church, there was always the question that would come up from time to time is how do we know that we are in truth? How do we know that we're not in error? And I think we always ended up at the same place, which was, well, you listen to the Spirit and you let the Spirit identify truth in your heart and you let the Spirit lead and guide you into, what's Jesus say? Into all truth. But then again, we know that the people we think are in error are quoting the same verse. So they're going, well, the Spirit's leading and guiding us into all truth. So then you ran into the, the matter of well, who's in truth and who's in error. And I, I think one thing we maybe need to admit or at least start with is the fact that in some way we're all a little bit in error. And that's okay. <laughs> what I mean by that is you're going to come up with another revelation in six months that's a little bit further into this than you have today. At least you hope you do so that you're not stagnant and your spiritual development. You're probably farther along than you were six weeks ago. You're going to look back in six months at the you of today and think, why did I feel that way about that issue so fervently? Boy, I was in error. Well, maybe not in the kind of error that is damaging to your spiritual development, but certainly in error compared to the you of six months from now. So I think it's okay to start with we're all a little bit in error, but that doesn't mean we're all not in truth. Because while we may see the, diff- the, the opposite of truth being error, I'm not sure that that's the biblical understanding. Because the biblical understanding of truth is not so much being right. Biblical understanding of truth is having restraint on your liberty. This is why the counterbalance of grace is not law. The counterbalance of grace is truth. Remember, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. It doesn't say the law was given by Moses and Jesus brought grace to balance it out. No. Because you have the law, which was this arbitrary thing. You could read it. You could see it. And in ancient Israel, you could even touch it. I mean, it's written on stones. And they bragged about the fact that it's on stones. That was both literal and metaphorical. It was literally on these rocks, but metaphorically, you can't erase it. It's this big thing that exists, this thing hanging over your life. And it tends to extremes, of course, because if it says thou shalt not, then that means thou shalt not. And if thou don't listen, you will pay a price. What is that price? And that's half the law is the price. Jesus doesn't come and give grace to swing the pendulum away from your performance and onto his performance because that would denote that There was a problem with the law that only grace could counterbalance and bring it back to the center. Grace has its own balancing mechanism, and that's truth, and truth is not your right. Truth is you have restraints on your liberty. You have restraints on your grace. You have the Holy Spirit in you who's leading and guide you into what? Truth. Why? Because grace has been provided to you, and you need to know how to walk in that grace. And you don't turn back to the law to figure out how to walk in grace because they aren't on the same side of the aisle. One is mosaic, one is Christocentric, Christ-centric, his finished work, and the message of grace flows out of the Christocentric work of Christ on the cross and the resurrection. So the law and grace are not to balance one another. They're two different worlds. And so we've learned that. That's the whole foundational heartbeat of grace is that I moved away from a system of my performance and into a system of his performance. My balance in the system of his performance is the fact that the Holy Spirit is inside of me giving me truth. Truth teaches me how to walk in grace. Truth says to me, truth is is in many respects the antidote to the chaotic in your life. It's the way to swing out of the chaotic into the order is the truth of the Holy Spirit saying to you, here's truth if you go down that road here's some stuff that will happen to you. And that truth keeps you from going down that road, doesn't it? I mean, 
Here's some truth. If you live in a bad neighborhood and you leave your door unlocked, what's the possible chaos that comes from that? That's not even a, that's an easy one. I mean, that's, that's just like societal understanding. You don't have to be spiritual. You don't have to be deep. You just have to live a little bit and realize, okay, I probably should have locked my door. That I could have spared myself some loss had I done that. That's sort of that balance to my liberty. My liberty is I can keep my door unlocked all night long if I want to. <laughs> of course you can. You would, do you need any restraints on that liberty? Well, if you don't want chaos, you might want restraint. And what we've done to help restrain people in, in many churches is we reintroduced the law. We went and grabbed Moses and we said, well, if it worked for Israel, it worked for us. Nobody ever points out that it didn't work for Israel. That, that's, the, that's the first error. So we go, if it, worked for, if it was good enough for the children of Israel, it's good enough for us. It wasn't good enough for the children of Israel. God knew it wasn't good enough. He wanted them to have covenant like Abraham had covenant. Just believe and I'll bless you. That wasn't good enough for them. They wanted a system of performances by which they could judge themselves worthy and God gave it to them and it never makes you worthy and that's what the law ends up doing is showing us that we're not worthy. And so dealing with error, don't worry quite so much. Let me say it this way. Maybe go a little easier on yourself on whether or not you've got it all figured out yet. Okay? Don't be in constant fear, trepidation, as to whether or not you're walking in perfect truth or whether or not you're walking in error. Your truth, the truth is you're walking in the Spirit. Intellectually, we've got some error in our stuff, but we're growing. And you've never met anyone yet that takes this serious, that doesn't feel like they'll be further down the road in a few months than they are today, and that's okay. But when you look back on that guy, you may go, why did I feel that way? It's also why you should probably go a little easier on the people around you, and that's going to segue me into the text this morning. You might go a little easier on the people around you who don't have all of your revelation, <laughs> who don't have all of your knowledge, because I, I, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I came out of a background of... of sort of hyper-religion, um, which and it's interesting to me that the detractors of grace who make fun of grace because it's hyper-grace never acknowledge hyper-religion as a problem. And that to me seems disingenuous. I mean, if you want to fight hyper-grace, at least admit that the opposite end of that intellectual spectrum would be hyper-religion which no one ever claims they're involved in until they're out of it. <laughs> you notice that? It, it takes moving into another realm of revelation to realize, well, well, that was me. I didn't realize there was any such thing as hyper-religion until I started being introduced to a hooper. That's the Greek phrase. That's where we get the English word hyper, which is the Greek phrase for superabundant grace. Remember when Paul says, where iniquity doth abound, grace doth much more abound. That's the good old King James way of saying that. Where iniquity doth abound, grace doth much more abound. Greek word, where iniquity doth abound, grace doth hooper abundant. Super, hyper abundant grace. So I don't actually, I don't shy away from that guy's hyper grace. I go, well, that's good because that means I'm preaching the same grace Paul preached. If there's a lot of iniquity, there needs to be a lot of grace. Otherwise, iniquity is going to win because iniquity is, is lawlessness. It's the breaking of law. And if grace can't help you, in that, then you're in trouble because you're not going to be able to keep the law. So you better lean into hyper grace. You need as much of it as you can get. And to say you don't is the first indication that you don't understand the law or grace. So you lean into that grace of God and allow that to do what it needs to do in your life. But maybe go easier on your neighbor because I come kind of swung out of hyper religion and looked back on old Paul from hyper religion and hated him and just spent months and years of preaching and berating him, how stupid he was and why he was so deceived. And you you kind of start to ease into this reality of who you are and, and relaxing a little bit in who you are in Christ and you start to take it a little, e it's, it's best if you're going to move on to take it a little easier on your old self because this knowledge starts to hit you. Six or eight months into the new you, 
you're realizing that the six or eight month old you didn't have it all right either. And if you're not careful, you'll spend your whole life looking back on the you from yesterday, upset at the slow pace of your development. And that will cause you to do that to everybody around you. And so you'll look at everybody around you that doesn't seem to have it and think, what's wrong with people? And ease up on yourself first. And then it might be easier to ease up on other people and to say, well, we're all on a journey. And it's the journey that is, in, that is crucial. It's the journey that is important. That takes us to Luke 6, and it took us there <laughs> in a little bit of a roundabout way. But I think before we're finished, you'll see perhaps why. I want to start in the 37th verse, but I want to read 37 and 38 because 38 is one of the more famous statements of Jesus. Luke 6, 37, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. Or as the old King James, I think, rightfully says in the Greek, running over shall men put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. I want to work through this text for a little bit. I want to start with the first two verses. We're going to add at least through the 42nd verse in a moment. And then we'll backtrack because I think context is king. Context is often abandoned when we study scripture. We just look at our verse, try to figure it out, and we don't stop sometimes to realize it might help to read the... I mean, you wouldn't pick up, you know, Robinson Crusoe and start on chapter 9. You, you might feel like you need to know what's going on with Robinson, you know. And so the first eight chapters could be relevant to the plot as it is developing in front of you. So if you want a good interpretation of where he is in chapter 9, at least chapter 8 would help, you know. Now, I realize that we can't always go, okay, I want to understand Luke 6.37. Let's read the first six and a half chapters of Luke every time we get together. We, I realize that kind of, that's not possible, but context does help. Well, the reason I'm bringing that up will come clearer in a moment when we do greater context, immediate context. Everybody recognized the most popular moment in this verse, and that was, given it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, shall men give into your bosom. And that's kind of all we quote. We quote the front 75% of the 38th verse. And we quote it most of the time at the offering. So someone gets up to take up the offering or we're starting to gather a collection and, someone, and there's always like six or eight good giving verses that you know is in the back pocket of the giving pastor, whoever that is, the offering pastor, the guy that's you know, the, maybe he's good looking and charismatic and people don't hate to look at him and listen to him. And so he gets the mic for 45 seconds to pull out scripture of the week on giving. And uh, if that doesn't shake and move people enough, there's always good old fashioned, don't rob from God, Old Testament, pre-cross, Levitical, old covenant priesthood needs your support, though it doesn't still exist. And here's what you can expect if you don't pull out that calculator and at least give 10% on your gross, not your net. <laughs> because you made that gross. Don't give to America and the county first. Give to God first. And then we used to have whole sessions on whether you should gross tithe or net tithe. Uh, <laughs> now those were the old days. Thank God I have discovered there's some gospel you can t preach rather than just economic control. Um, one of the popular back pocket verses is, is Luke 6, 38. Hey, give and it shall be given to you. Press down, shaking together, men going to give into your bosom. And that has been associated with the offering. And so we made this a financial verse. I wanted to read at least the verse in front of it to show you that Jesus doesn't go into this talking about money at all. Watch 37 again. Watch these comparisons. Judge not, you won't be judged. Condemn not, you won't be condemned. Forgive, you'll be forgiven. Give, it'll be given to you. There's four of them. I think we hone in on the last one because A, it's in its own verse, and B, give to us means money. 
or at least that's how we want to interpret this text because who doesn't want other people giving them money, pressed down, shaken together, running over, people give to you. How many of you, this didn't work for you financially in the realm of giving? Must be, we, and I'm not looking for hands, but be very honest with yourself. It didn't happen. You gave, but men didn't walk up to you and give, 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 give until you could shake it together, press it down. Then they gave more until it ran over. No? I've been in this for 41 years. Never saw that ever once. Was that the end result of you having financially given is that people gave until you could press it down, shake it together, and then they gave until it ran over? In fact, the word bosom here indicates the ability to carry. There's a couple different Greek words for bosom in the New Testament. One's, say, John 1, where, or there's a couple, indi- there's different definitions of the Greek depending on its context and its tense. Remember John 1 where it's introducing Jesus and it says, He's the only begotten of the Father from... He was the only begotten of God from the bosom of His Father. Some of you have probably heard me refer to that in other sermons. We're doing a John study in our midweek group and we covered that pretty intently. And that, that bosom of the Father is the Hebrew word for breast. And it's literally John saying Jesus came from the motherly side of God. So he becomes a, an earthly expression of the feminine nature of God. Now that's worth its own sermon, I understand, but he definitely uses the Hebrew word for bosom, and he doesn't mean anything but female. And that's weird because we don't think of God in those terms. So bosom can most certainly mean exactly what it sounds like it means, and then there's another way to define it, which is the Luke 6 way. And the Luke 6 way is a Greek word for the the pocket inside of a robe. Now, pockets as we have them did not exist in the time of Christ. That was apparently a fashion choice no one had yet decided was feasible. It doesn't exist. There's no pockets, but the Greek word there is that you take the fold of your robe and you open it so that people can pour stuff in it, and then you just held on to the robe. And that's the bosom. That's, That's a almost a fashion usage of the word bosom in the Greek. It also reappears, it it appears in the Hebrew in stuff like Ruth, in the book of Ruth where Boaz, Ruth and Boaz have their encounter, their first, sort of their first meeting, and Boaz says to Ruth, "Um, open up your robe and I I will fill it with grain, you can take it home. And what he's doing in the Hebrew vernacular, when it's retranslated into the Septuagint, it's the same phrase Jesus used in Luke 6, Open your robe, I'll pour in grain, seal that next to your heart and take that home with you. And so that's the word that Jesus uses when he says, shall men give into your bosom. So it's, it's not something of who you are. That would be from the bosom of the Father, from the breast or from the heart, Jesus comes out of God. So it's not men giving in to you and your identity. It's men giving you something you can carry. That's the word Jesus is using. They shall give you something you can carry with you. Well, what's the, con- the greater context of the things men can carry with you? Well, look at 37. Don't judge, you won't be judged. Don't condemn, you won't be condemned. If you forgive, you will be forgiven. So it sounds as if Jesus has you dealing with interpersonal relationships. And we actually know this based on the end of 38, where as, the, as I said when we read it, the old King James properly translates, shall men give to you. So 37 and 38 are talking about, God, about your relationship with other people. If you judge, what do other people do to you? They tend to judge you back. If you condemn other people, how do they tend to treat you? They condemn you. If you forgive other people, how do they tend to treat you? They forgive you back. If you give to other people these things, they give them back to you. So the whole given it shall be given is less financial and more something you carry in society based upon what you give to society. So if everywhere you go, you give out judgment, what do people give back to you? Judgment. And not only will they give it back to you, they'll give it back to you pressed down, shaken together, running over. Now that makes way more sense than give 10, get 100, because you know it didn't work. But you're pretty sure this works because you've tried it before. Judge other people and watch hell open up for you. Condemn other people. Spend your life pointing out people's faults and condemn them in their actions 
what happens? People will find every possible chance to pour into your bosom. What does that mean? Not your identity, but for you to carry the weight and the load of condemnation. Forgive other people and watch how easy it is for them to forgive you. Don't forget, you could say conversely, don't forgive other people and watch how difficult it is for other people to forgive you. And it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give it to you in a place you can carry it. And this is a vital and important thing that Jesus wants us to know because this is interpersonal. This is not us to God. This is not God's Jesus saying to you, if you don't judge, God won't judge you. If you don't condemn, God won't condemn you. No. Otherwise, it has nothing to do with men giving into your bosom. It would be God giving into your bosom heart, not what you carry. So your identity is influenced by God's treatment of you. Your identity is only affected by what other people think of you if you allow it to be. You carry what other people think about you or what other people say about you, and you can let that go. It doesn't speak into your heart. It speaks into your mind. This is why Jesus said, take no thought for how you shall clothe yourself. Take no thought for whether you shall be fed. What did he mean? It's going to fly past you. Don't grab it. That's the system of the world. They're going to run a lot of stuff past the theater of your mind. Don't take the stuff you don't need. Now that's easier said than done, right? It would be easier to do if we would limit the amount of screens passing our face. We've become so accustomed to reading everybody else's take and everybody else's opinion. And we also now live in a society where we take so much of our own value by how many people like our post or enjoy our Snapchat. And so we've now have, we have so much inundating us of everyone's opinion or everyone's philosophy that we having, it's harder to not take. Now, we live in a 600 mile an hour world transportation wise you got to get in an airplane today and it's going to go 6 that always blows my mind it's going to go 600 mile an hour 35,000 feet above the earth and you're going to cover 1000 miles in no time less than 2 hours Jesus lived in the 3 mile per hour world that was about the speed the donkey walked right now that world actually existed till about the middle of the 19th century most of man's history. He lived in a three mile per hour world. Then it jumped up to about a 30 mile per hour world and it stayed there till the first quarter of the 20th century. And the stress level of self-identity went up as the speed went up. If you sort of correlate how people began to see themselves in the, in the world, it sort of went up with the speed of the world. In a three mile per hour world, people didn't stop in front of the mirror every day to check themselves. They didn't worry so much about how they were projected because it didn't matter as much. Stuff didn't move very fast. I mean, if the president is, says something, you hear about it two weeks after he said it. And for a long, long time, we were a nation that realized we probably didn't need him as much as he thought we needed him. We did pretty good and didn't even know what he was doing for two weeks after he did it. And now we live in a world where we know what someone thinks three seconds after they think it. Not just what they say, but they bothered to write it down and then we get in in on it. That becomes a lot tougher, bunch of stuff passing us, it becomes a lot tougher to not take some of it. It's like taking the bait. Okay, And we start to derive identity, unfortunately, But we do, we start to derive identity by what those voices think of us. I think this text more than ever needs to be reiterated in the lives of people as what we're putting out there, it tends to be what we end up feeding on as well. If we're putting out judgment and we're putting out condemnation, it's probably because we're feeding on judgment and we're feeding on condemnation. We sort of regurgitate what we're feeding on from the society of the world. And that's a 
well, it's a detrimental way to, to govern ourselves. I think that becomes pretty obvious. So give and it will be given to you. Keep that in the same context as 37. Keep 38 in the same context as 37, that it's given to you. And as it's given to you, it's because of what you've been giving out. Running over, be put into your bosom. For, and here's how I know. Last sentence, 38. For with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. However you dole it out is how you can expect to receive it. That's the system of the world. So if you dole out judgment, you expect to receive judgment. If you dole out condemnation, you expect to receive condemnation. If you dole out forgiveness, you expect to receive forgiveness. What you give, you expect to receive. What if you were giving mercy? What if you were giving grace? What if you were giving understanding? What if you were looking at the people around you who you think are in error and you were, having, you were taking it a little easier on them? And how might they handle you whenever they bump up against something that you believe or something that you are of which they don't, aren't in 100% agreement? Now, I realize that not everybody gives back to us exactly what we give to them. This is, the world is categorically unfair. Sometimes you show a man mercy and he shows you judgment, right? This is you being misused in the world. That's part of learning that the world doesn't care as much for you as you care for yourself. <laughs> That's just a fact. And some of that is growing into that knowledge and growing up and understanding that. But this is a basic set of principles by which Jesus tells us we ought to be governing ourselves. And I know that because look at the pretext. Go back to, say, verse 30. Three. We could go back further, but let's go to 33. Luke 6, 33. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same thing. Okay, so this is a good starting block. If you're going to do good to people that do you back, what in the world does that make you? It doesn't make you a believer. I mean, even an unbeliever would do good to people that do good to them, right? Very few people do bad to people who do good to them. That's straight up malevolence. I mean, that's the guy that just wants to watch the world burn. They exist, but they're an anomaly. They're not the norm. We don't govern our lives around the anomaly. We might prepare for it, but we don't move into the world expecting that every person we meet is malevolent. So the reality is, is you're not any different than an unbeliever if you only are good to people who are good to you. 34, if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit's that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. Love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. Underline that in your mind or maybe literally in your text and run an arrow to 38. Because here's a bridge for you. 35. Let's read 35 again. Look at the middle of it. Lend and don't hope for anything in return. What's 38 say? Give and it will be given to you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together. 35's about money. 38's not, because if 38's about money, it just contradicted 35. 35 says give to people and don't expect anything back. 38 says give and people are going to give to you. Press down, shake it together, running over shall men give into your bosom. And we get up and teach that is giving. Give money and people are going to give money back to you. No, you're three verses too far. Go back three verses. Give and don't ever expect anybody to give back to you. That's a much better way to govern yourself in the world so that you don't ever feel ripped off. Right? I mean, you set yourself for ripe ripoff if you give to somebody expecting return because not everybody's going to give exactly the same amount of money back. 38's not about giving money and getting money. 38's about getting back what you put into the world and you'll get it back in abundance. Put love into the world, you get love back. Put hate into the world, you get hate back. Put forgiveness into the world, you get forgiveness back. Not from God, but from man. My gosh, not from God. You get stuff from God you can't pay for and you'll never earn. That's the very definition of grace. You don't go to God saying, hey, if you don't judge me, I won't judge you. That's, it. That's a dumb transaction. <laughs> that doesn't even make any sense. I mean, you only need that kind of transaction interpersonally. Now, that transaction has to do with how we treat one another, not with how God treats us. So it's kind of amazing that we, we discount 37 as being about us and God, and then when it's offering time, 38 becomes about us and God. You know, give to God, and God's going to make people give to you. No, 
No, we, we give, don't expect anything in return. That's 35. We lend, but we don't hope for anything in return. Your reward's going to be great. You'll be sons of the Most High, for he's kind to the unthankful and the evil. Well, that's an amazing statement. Look at the end of verse 35 and memorize it. God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. If God is kind to unthankful and evil people, how might you treat unthankful and evil people? You're being set up, by the way, in verse 35. Jesus is good at that. He's setting up his audience. What's the last statement of 35? God is kind to unthankful and evil people. So watch this little run he's about to go on. 36, 37, 38. In light of the fact that God is kind to evil and unthankful people, therefore you should be merciful the way the Father is merciful. You should not judge so that you cannot expect to be judged back. You should not condemn so that you can expect not to be condemned back. You should forgive so that you can expect to be forgiven back. You should give to people so that you can expect for it to be given back to you. Why? Because God is kind to unthankful and evil people. And all around you are unthankful and evil people. And if you run around every day judging them, condemning them, not forgiving them, get ready. They are evil and they are unthankful. And how do you think they are going to treat you? Now, Jesus is pretty good at telling you how to govern yourself in a world that doesn't care if you live or die. And that's pretty good information to have because that crosses culture and time. And you're in a world where it's all moving a lot faster than it was when Jesus said it. You're not riding a three mile per hour donkey anymore. And you're not just riding a 600 mile per hour jet. You're riding a fiber optic cable that moves at the, almost at the speed of light and puts information in the middle of Hong Kong the moment you let go of it in the middle of Wichita. And the world has changed. And you can send a signal out to a rover on Mars and it doesn't get there in three months. It gets there in moments. And that boggles the mind. And that is, well, that is unbelievable. And as it speeds up, this whole process seems to speed up as well. And so more than ever, we need to recognize how to deal with one another in an ever-changing world. And Jesus has given us the exact information that we need. Now, you've had the pretext. You've had the text. Go to 39. It's 37, 38 is the whole don't judge, don't condemn. You must forgive, then give. Look at 39. And he spoke a parable. And I want to try to help you today maybe wrap your mind around this parable and why he drops this in right here. Let's read the whole thing from 39 to 42, and we'll come back. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple's not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't perceive the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite! First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. All right, I... Take this text, and the, the last part seems pretty obvious. It seems to connect easily back to, hey, don't judge, don't condemn, you better forgive. Why wouldn't you? you got a beam hanging out of your eyeball, and you're judging people that's got a speck in their eyes, so it seems like it would be a good place to start at your front door, right? And that's pretty good advice for navigating the world. Like, how are you going to fix Wichita when you can't fix yourself? And I think people need reminded of that a lot because we're all world changers and that's what we get trained to be in the church go out and be a world changer and we can't change our own socks well maybe we should have started with a class on that and then world because world changing is darn lofty if you can't change your own mind world changing is darn lofty if you can't have your mind changed it's like i I already got it figured out. Well, then forget changing the world because you were already approaching it going down the wrong road. Okay? Maybe a good place to start was I could have my mind changed and maybe I need to. You think? The New Testament's full of the word repent. So I promise you, you need to change your mind and that frequently. <laughs> mind change is essential to navigating a real fast world. And so you're going to have to have moments of mind change where I'm not talking about 
you don't have any stability, but moments where your mind can be changed because, hey, there might be a plank in your eye. Now, it's kind of a humorous illustration. I think the crowd probably found it quite funny because no, none nobody had ever met anyone with a plank hanging out of their eye or a splinter. Jesus goes over the top. It's a metaphor that is unnecessary, but it works that way, right? Because you think, well, what guy would possibly notice something so small as a speck if he had something that bad wrong with him? Well, that's the point that Jesus is making, is most of the time that you are judging and condemning and not forgiving and moting out, meeting out to people, most of the time it comes from a place of having to do it while dragging the plank around. You're actually working around your own issues while you're trying to solve everybody else's. So I think this is a pretty important passage of understanding how to navigate through the world. What about the whole blind, blind lead and the blind part? Why did he throw that story in? Well, the more you start to realize that you might be carrying a plank around the more you realize that maybe what Jesus is saying is, who are you to fix people? You're both blind. And then he follows up with that strange little 40th verse, a disciple's not above his teacher, but everyone who's perfectly trained would be like his teacher. I think what Jesus is saying is this, you're not better than anybody else you meet, and the very best you could do if you were perfectly trained is simply be as good as the best person you meet. That's all you could expect. So if you were perfectly trained, if you did everything just right, the best you could be is as good as the best person that trained you. That makes sense, right? That's Jesus' point. Honestly, he says, as you navigate the world, you're not blind in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you eyes to see things you can't see. But when you navigate other people, you are blind because you don't know their background and you don't know what kind of day they've had and you don't know their hopes and their dreams and you don't know what moves them and what shakes them and what molds them and what makes them. And who do you think you are that you know? He said, in that moment, you're a blind man leading a blind man and the best you could ever figure to do is just be as good as the best person you've ever met. He said, and the reason is because we're, we're moving in the world as if we have a beam hanging out of our eye, trying to fix the speck problems of our neighbor because, man, that speck ticks me off. <laughs> I got a bunch of junk I haven't figured out, and I need to get it right. Now, these, these moments in the text, I'll be honest with you, they're not always fun to hang out in. And the reason they're not always fun to hang out in is because they, they show us that we might not be all we think we are. And no one really likes that revelation. You know, we want to we find out that we're more than we think we are. Well, in Christ, he lives in you and you live in him. And in that, your identity is his son and his daughter. And don't ever forget it. And for that, I would say you're probably more than you think you are. If you think you, in the eyes of God, are only what you do, then I would challenge your thinking you are more than what you think you are because my son and my daughter are not the sum of what they do. They are to you because that's interpersonal. As far as you're concerned, they are what you see them do. But to me, they are the sum of who they are because they, I know they are mine. I look into their eyes, I see their mother. I look into their eyes, I see myself. Most of what I can't stand that comes out of my kids are usually the reflection of the things I see in them that look like me. <laughs> and that's usually the way it ought to be. The things that you see come out of them that look like you, you might go, boy, I wish there was a little more of mom coming out of them right now than the things coming out of them that look like me. You know, the beauty of children is that you're reproducing not only yourself but the person you think is God's best gift for you on the earth and you're doing that in another human being and that is a marvelous thing and so you are that's why you should treat your children as if you've just reproduced yourself on the earth and then you ought to live like somebody that the kid wants to grow up to be like and that'll make you grow up fast and that's why every new parent says, boy, I had to grow up really fast. Why is that? Because you went into it and it was all you on the earth stumbling around to find you. And then you saw yourself 
in the eyes of that kid and realize that they're looking up. There's a reason they're shorter and smaller than you for most of their life. They're looking up at you and that is something lofty and worth taking serious because you might want to reproduce yourself in the earth and God knows you're not real happy with some of the stuff you see in yourself. And so you start growing up fast. We, do, we get that when it comes to interpersonal when we start talking about our kids. Okay, we get that because we reproduced ourselves on the earth and we reproduced our spouse. And that's why your spouse ought to hold such a lofty position. They should have been so lofty in your heart, you wanted to copy them on the earth. And you did. And that's called your kids. And you ought to hold them there until the day you die. Because no matter what happens, that little one is half them. And that's a big thing. And that's how your father views you. And so no more than looking at your children and equating their, your love for them based on the sum of their actions. You could never do that. They're your kids. Your DNA is in there. This is why you have to be very careful what you fall in love with because once you fall, it is too late. And what I mean by that is, is you're going to give a piece of yourself over to what you fall in love with. God creates man in the garden. It's too late to take it back. He saw his own eyes in Adam's eyes and he fell madly in love with him. And when Adam sins, God could have just killed him and started over. But you can't do that because once you fall in love, it's too late. You're going to have to chase it out. And so the whole Bible is God taking two steps behind Adam in love with him and chasing him down. So much so that he wraps himself up in an earth suit and comes to the planet in a man named Jesus and says, if I can't win them through talking to them, I'll win them by being one of them. And if that doesn't work, I'll die on their behalf because I've noticed they take the highest value in self-sacrifice. And so I'll go to the cross and I'll die on their behalf. And Paul grabs that in Romans 5 and says, God manifested his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It was God showing off to you, going, greater love with no man than this. Then he lays down his life for his friends. Watch what I'm about to do for you. He dies at Calvary and he comes out. Of the, then that's, a, that's an incredible run of theology that simplifies the Bible down into a couple of sentences. It's really that you were so, God was so passionately in love with you that it's too late to give up on you. He's got too much invested in you to give up on you. Relax. He loves you. He can't help it. If you've ever had kids, you'll know what I'm talking about. And those of you that have them know exactly. You don't give up on them. You keep chasing them down. You keep doing what you can. Because you don't view them as the value of what they do. You view them as the value of who they are. And that's big. That's you in the eyes of God. Stop judging yourself on what you do. But let me tell you this. Your neighbor doesn't care about your internal identity. So your neighbor is going to give back to you what you give to them. God won't give back to you what you give to him. Why? Because you're his kid. I don't give back to my kids what they give to me. Right? When your kid gives you stupidity and rebellion, you don't try to match that as a dad. <laughs> I'm going to be as stupid as you are today. It's not even a real good way to, come, to converse with your kid, right? Can you imagine that kind of father? All right, as dumb as you are, I'm going to be equally dumb. I'm going to match all of your stupid decisions with a stupid decision of my own because I can be more stupid than you are. Well, that's a dumb way to parent and navigate through the world, and that's hell, right? Hey, man, you want to see hell in action, watch... Adults that don't adult kids, but they have them. And we're seeing hell in action on the earth because we have adults that don't adult kids. They are kids who live with smaller versions of themselves. And that's hell. But that's not God. So when you're, when you're stupid to your father and you act like an idiot, your father doesn't match your stupidity by giving to you, press down, shaking together, running over. You want to be dumb, I'll be dumb. No, your father gives to you what a father gives to stupid and rebellious children. Sometimes discipline, all the time leadership. And a better way to govern yourself. Whether you like it or not, he can speak it to you or at least show it to you. And if you, as you grow up, this is why when we all grew up, we grew into a place where mom and dad's advice started to mean more than it did at certain points in our life because we started to need it more, right? We started to go into a world and go, boy, I wish I had listened faster, but I'll be hanged if I'm not going to listen now because I could use some of that. And that helps. That's how God feels about you. And so he's not duplicating your moronic stuff with more of his own. 
He's showering mercy, mercy on you. It's why that verse, it's why that sentence a moment ago from 35 was he's kind to the unthankful and the evil. Why? Because he's a good father. So you're unthankful and you're evil often to him, but what's he to you? Merciful and not judgmental, not condemning. He forgives and he gives. So that is how your father wants you to treat your neighbor. That's how he wants you to deal with your neighbor. And if you don't deal with them in that way, maybe you need to remember that in your actions with your neighbor, you're blind to who they really are. So stop trying to fix everybody because that's the blind leading the blind. The best you can ever figure to be is exactly how you were taught. Even if you were taught perfectly, you're only going to be as good as you were taught. So relax a little bit on yourself and go easier a little bit on yourself. And that might help you go easier on your neighbor because Jesus then gives that funny story about the beam and the speck and it all is so real when we start to realize a few times we tried to fix other people. And I try to wind it down by saying that I think there is a, a lot of importance to understanding the need to take the beam out of our eye if we're going to start removing the specks from the world. And I know that we have to have that world changer mentality and we have that idea that the planet is ours to save. And I think all of that's pretty smart in, in a way because if you're not going to do it, who is? And if you're not going to at least take a baby step to start, who is going to take the first baby step to start, right? If you're not going to play your part, who's going to play their part? Or you can just sit back and say to hell with the world, Jesus is going to come take us all away. And that's been the theology of the church for a couple hundred years. And it's why we've almost lost our handle on the planet and on understanding what's going on in our neighbor. Because we've taken a sort of anything goes attitude, God will win in the end. And I think the kingdom is better than that. And if the kingdom is a seed in the ground supposed to be growing into a big tree, maybe we ought to start getting under its branches. And so as the kingdom spreads on the earth and we begin to treat our neighbor as we wish we were treated, that's a very Jesus principle. We will see that there's a couple of things we might need to take out of our own issues before we can fix the issues of other people. And guys, what I just described to you is, is a complete, as complete a picture as I know how to teach on grace and truth. But grace is have, take it easy on yourself because the Father takes it easy on you. The truth is, you better learn how to do that to your neighbor. Otherwise, you're going to invite hell into your life, and that's no way to live. So you can take grace and just receive all of God's favor and say to hell with everyone else, I already am God's righteousness. They just need to figure it out. Or you can take the truth, and you can go express your liberty in a particular way that makes the world a better place. Freedom is the absence. What is freedom? You're, it is for freedom you've been set free, right? What's freedom? Freedom is the absence of restraints imposed upon you by others. The fewer restraints imposed upon you by others, the freer you are. The more restraints imposed upon you by others, the less free you are. Now, in America, we look at that as government because we say the more restraints government puts on me, the less free I am. I think that's true. The more restraints your government issues to your life in every little area, the less free you are in that area. Put enough, put enough on. It's like maybe the chain's not real big, so you don't think much of it. But what would a thousand little chains be? You know, it's kind of like you didn't get stabbed in the heart, but you had death by a thousand cuts. What's death by a thousand cuts? What's that a metaphor? What's that mean? Well, none of them were real big but there were just so darn many of them. Well, that's sort of what happens in liberty. None of it's real big, but there was just so many restraints. They were tiny on their own, but then there was that one and 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 that one. And I think we've seen that happen in the church. There was no real big obvious chain. Nobody rolled out the huge restraint. There was just so many little ones that every time you turned around, you weren't as free as you had thought you were free. Until you realized you looked down one day and there were a thousand tiny chains. And whereas you could have probably broke three or four of them pretty easily on your own, a thousand of them are just too many for anybody. Now you're miserable and you're dead inside because you're not mobile anymore. You can't do anything. So the more you're absent of restraints imposed by others, the freer you are. But hear this. Here comes truth to that grace, that message. The freer you are the more responsible you are to restrain your own self. Because with freedom comes a great level 
of responsibility. You say, well, that's Spider-Man, right? Isn't that, what, isn't that what Peter Parker's uncle tells Peter Parker? With great power comes great responsibility. Well, Peter Parker's uncle stole it from Jesus. <laughs> I mean, Jesus said it first. He didn't say it quite so Marvel comic-like, but he did say, to whom much is given, much is required. Okay? Maybe it's not as, maybe it's not as Marvel cool as with great power comes great responsibility. But it's, it's just, you know, it, the essence of where liberty is yours comes a great level of responsibility to use that liberty for the betterment of yourself and your neighbor and to not use your liberty to steamroll your neighbor and call it liberty, right? Because the moment your liberty puts a restraint on your neighbor, your liberty is now went to seed. And your neighbor is going to rise up to stake to take your liberty from them as he rightfully should because you're trying to rob his and so that's why what i've been talking to people about grace and truth because what truth does is it's us putting a restraint on our liberty it's really the holy spirit putting a restraint on our liberty saying you may not want to do that because it's going to cause chaos in your life and it's going to hurt your neighbor and your neighbor means more than you think he does and guys that's an that's an that's an archetype the Bible starts out with in Genesis. Cain says to God, am I my brother's keeper? The answer, what's the answer? <gasps> yes, Cain. It took you killing him to figure it out. And that's the tragedy of Cain and Abel. Is we killed our brother before we figured out we were supposed to save our brother. And the Bible's trying to warn you, don't do that. You are your brother's keeper, and you, you might want to remember it. And how many of you realize Jesus' whole ministry is you are your brother's keeper? His whole ministry is how you treat your neighbor. And he asks you to carry the load a mile, carry it too. And he hits you, turn your other cheek, and treat others the way you wish you were treated, and love one another as I have loved you. Did you notice all those are out, 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 out? That's the truth on the other side of your grace. Have some restraint in your liberty that ends at the doorstep of your neighbor. And don't cause him grief and pain. And limit yourself if need be. Okay, what's that practically look like in grace? Look, you're free. All things are lawful for you. Not all things are going to expedient for you. And according to 1 Corinthians 10, not all things are going to edify your neighbor. So maybe you put some limits on your own liberty. And maybe that varies from room to room. Because you're around someone who you know would be very offended if you expressed your liberty in a certain way. Then don't do it. Yeah, but I want them to know how free they could be. No, you don't. You want them to know how free you are. You don't care how free they are. That's not the purpose of your liberty. You want to express your own liberties. You go, well, they ought to grow up in Jesus. Well, maybe you ought to grow up in Jesus. Because if you grew up in Jesus, you'd put some restraints on your liberty. The immaturity may not be on the other side of the room. It may be on yours. Or shall we say, quit worrying about the speck. You're dragging a beam. That sounds real Jesus-like, right? So you're not out here to show everybody that they could be free. You're walking in your liberty and you're restraining that liberty because who are you to fix the splinter of lack of freedom in your neighbor's eye as long as you drag around the beam of self-righteousness trying to brag about your own freedom in your own eye. And that's Jesus' point. Final words. Don't let anybody rob this from you. Don't let anybody take your freedom. You're adults. You're at liberty in Christ. So grow up and act like it. Hold on to it like a bulldog. You cannot stop from suffering in the world. The world is unfair, sometimes decidedly unfair. Sometimes you're going to be in physical pain and mental pain and financial anguish. You can't stop suffering, but you can deal with how you can handle how you deal with suffering. That stops at your doorstep. You can let it run your brain into chaos until suicide's all that's left for you because you've lost meaning. You can let physical pain define you until you stop leaving the house and all you do is cry. You can let your lack of success control you until you stay in jobs you hate because you don't deem yourself capable of doing one you love. That is all your choice. You can't stop the suffering, but you can stop how you deal with the suffering. And that's part of putting some understanding onto your liberty. 
and saying, I'm an adult and I'm one of my father's children and I want to move in this world as if Christ moves through me. Can't stop the suffering you can handle how you deal with it and don't let anybody take your liberty because it's yours. And I like stopping there in meetings because I want you to walk out and realize you do have something worth holding on to. So start holding on to it. Protect it. Don't give everybody the same amount of screen time in your life. It's a fast, fast world. You're not equipped for that. God created you in a three mile per hour world. You live in one that's off the charts. You were not created to process so much information of what people think about everything. Don't feel obligated to give your opinion and don't respect everybody else's. You live in a culture that tries to make you think that being accepting is respecting all opinions. Why would you respect all opinions? Hitler's opinion was that there was an actual race of people who were superior to other races and the races inferior deserved to die. Should you respect that opinion? Stop believing the lie that everybody's opinion is worth your attention and your time and your respect. Stop believing the lie that everybody is worth your respect. Everybody gets liberty and should fight for it and die for it if necessary, but they're not all worth your respect. And the faster you realize that, the happier and more at peace you'll be because you'll stop feeding your identity based on everybody else's opinion. Because some opinions don't need to be swallowed by you. They need to be ignored by you. You keep giving validity to every voice, you'll feel the need to fight back every time someone disagrees. And that's an endless battle and one that will rob your peace and your sleep. It needs to be some voices you say, I have no respect for nor time for. And I don't value their opinion near as much as I value others. And with all of that said, find voices you do value because there is value in the voices of those who love you. Find the voices you value and cling towards that sound. And follow the Spirit. The greatest gift you've been given by God is to be able to follow the Spirit. All right. Father, I thank you for the word. I thank you for the help you've given us in presenting it. I pray it has been effective. I pray it finds fertile soil. And Father, if we leave here today and we cling to our liberty, I think it will affect how we treat our neighbor and it will affect how we handle ourselves in the world. Yes, Father. Just... I pray, Father, strength of character and awareness of identity on everyone in this room. And I pray that they hold fast, as Paul said, to their liberty wherewith Christ has made them free and teach them what that looks like and give them your wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen.